Okay, so today we have a topic for discussion. Uh, last week we spoke about composites, so that was the basics of composites in which we discussed the newer techniques of cavity preparation. Uh, most of you might have attended the last week's conversation. So uh, today we'll talk about something called veneers. So veneers, we all know what is veneers, right? We've all done clinical practice where we've either done veneers or we've seen veneers. We know there are different techniques in preparing veneers. Different materials are available in the market for doing veneers it's like ceramics. Uh, one of the important materials when we do direct veneers are composites. So today we'll take a look at direct composite veneers and indirect ceramic veneers. So it all started back in 1928 when uh, Hollywood was booming up and all the actors wanted a bright white smile on the screen. So Dr. Charles Pincus, he's the person who pioneered in veneers at those times and uh, popularized veneers. So basically they were just direct crown preparations on two where ceramic pieces used to be looted. So, you know, people used to get that white smile and then that's how veneers became very popular. According to a definition, it's just a layer of tooth colored material that we apply to a tooth for aesthetically restoring the tooth or even to correct generalized defects, localized defects or mild discolorations. So when we look at why, where all can we use veneers? So veneers are great for a few purposes, but they are not great for some other purposes. So what are the conditions we can give veneers? We can give veneers for the following conditions, that is closing minor spaces. So sometimes the patient comes to you for diastema closure, space closure, post orthodontic treatment, the patient might end up having minor spaces in between teeth. So for all these kinds of minor space corrections, you can always think of veneers. Minor tooth position improvements, that is a single tooth uh, uh, rotation or a slight single tooth overlapping the other tooth, et cetera. At the end of the treatment or at the end of again, orthodontic treatment, the patient doesn't want to correct it or has no time to complete it. These are the conditions where you can think of doing veneers because veneers are somewhat minimally invasive. They are not treatment where you have to cut a lot of tooth structure. We are limiting our preparations to around one mm or less than one mm. Then lengthening short teeth or worn out teeth. Sometimes uh, the patient wants a very good smile and we know that naturally central incisors are longer than the laterals and the canines are almost the same length of centrals. So if those are lost because of some reason, like attrition and all that, you can always think of first finding the reason for attrition, correcting it, and then you can aesthetically restore the tooth by giving veneers. Then improving tooth shape, you've seen peg laterals, malformed teeth, some teeth which has some certain smile or discoloration patches on them that cannot be removed by bleaching and all that. Those are good cases for doing veneers. And teeth, correcting teeth in lingual version. Sometimes you might have seen lingually worted upper teeth. So the overbite might be normal. Overjet may or may not be normal, but not an incisal uh, edge to edge bite. In those cases, the teeth are lingually worted, giving veneers on them might increase the proclamation of teeth. Post orthodontic treatment, sometimes you might see uh, intrinsic discolorations like brown stains where the brackets were placed and all that. Those kind of discolorations can be corrected by giving veneers. And then, of course, to change the shade of a tooth, you can give veneers. There are pe people working in uh, areas where they have to continuously smile, like, for example, cabin crew, media personalities, news readers, anchors on television. All these kind of people might come to you every year for bleaching. So rather than doing every year or every six months bleaching, you can always think of doing veneers from canine to canine because they permanently restore the uh, shade correction problem. Now, even though they are indicated for all these things, there are certain contraindications also. One of the main contraindication is cases where there is no sufficient enamel because this is all uh, something that we bond to enamel. So ceramics are bonded to enamel, composites are bonded to enamel. So we need a good bonding surface. We need adequate enamel to uh, cover the uh, bonding area. So if there is no enamel, that is higher fractured teeth, more than certain extent of the tooth is fractured, large composite fillings on tooth, uh, which are already done because of the fractured tooth, or cases where there's a lot of dentine exposure and not sufficient enamel exposure, these are not good cases for doing veneer. 
Then pulpless teeth, even though the textbook says pulpless teeth is not a good uh, teeth for doing veneers, you can think of cases where endodontically treated tooth also you can give veneers provided you warn the patient that in the long run, the tooth stump inside might discolor and then the veneer might look discolored. So these are also cases where you can think of veneers. Then pronounced overbites, parafunction habits like vaxism, night grinding and all that. Unsuitable clinical presentations. That is teeth that are too small. You cannot restore a large tooth surface by doing a veneer. In that case, you may have to go for a crown or where a post and core is indicated, you might have to do post and core. You might have to do a core build up and then give a crown. A veneer may not be indicated. So these are contraindications. Now, single veneers are a contraindication according to the textbook. That is true because most of the time when you do a single tooth correction, uh, getting the shade adequately right is very difficult. So most of the time we do veneers in pairs. We always do two teeth at a time, adjacent teeth along with the main tooth. So caries and fillings. So uh, laminate veneers are used for uh, minor caries corrections, but when it comes to large composite restrictions on the tooth, it's not good indication. So suppose a patient comes with a diastema problem and the diastema has already been treated by a composite restriction. Before thinking of doing veneers, you may have to remove the composite restriction, see the natural tooth, the diastema gap, and then do the veneers. You cannot do veneers on top of the composite restrictions. And then, of course, poor dental care and oral hygiene. Periodontally compromised teeth, teeth that are not um, well managed by the patients. You cannot give margins that are very difficult to clean. You may have to limit your preparations to supragingival or over uh, equigingival margins. For very high aesthetic uh, subgingival margins, the oral hygiene of the patient should be excellent. The patient should be able to communicate very well and he should be able to keep his gums very clean, come for regular follow-ups and things like that. Otherwise, you may have to keep your margins to flexible areas. Now, uh, let's look at the classification. So we have basically partial veneers and full veneers. Partial veneers, even though the textbook says it still, uh, it's not very popular because uh, one, uh, technique-wise, it's more difficult than doing a full veneer. And for aesthetic reasons, full veneers gives much better aesthetics than partial veneers. Even though both these things are there, based on the technique of preparation, there is either direct veneers or indirect veneers. Now, when it comes to direct veneers, you only have one material that is composite. So basically you prepare the tooth surface, that is the labial surface of the teeth. And then once you prepare it by reducing it to 0.7 mm, 1 mm, 1.2 mm, after that reduction is done, then you layer composite on top of the tooth and you cure the composite. So what do you get is a new shade. You get the shade of the composite that you use. So that is direct composite veneers. It's a great way of correcting a lot of problems. Like you might have seen small class three fractures, uh, class four fractures, uh, sometimes the patient will come to you with uh, uh, teeth which have worn out incisal edges, uh, slight discolorations, brown pits on the teeth, uh, white patches on the teeth. All these kind of cases, you can always think of doing a direct composite veneer because the shade that you get from completely covering the label side is much better than only correcting that particular point. When you correct only a class three or class four, what happens is most of the time a demarcation line appears if you can't polish it very well. That can be avoided. And strength-wise also, a direct composite veneer is much stronger than a small composite restriction. Then we have, of course, in, indirect veneers. So indirect veneers, we have basically two types. One is uh, a prefabricated veneer, and one is a customized veneer. So we'll come to that in detail. We'll come to the different types in detail. Uh, but technique-wise, when you look at veneers, we have three techniques to do veneers. One is a window preparation, one is a featherage preparation, and one is an incisal la la lapping preparation. So these are the three preparations we use, and there is also something called a bevel preparation. We'll come to that later. But basically, we have three types of uh, incisal preparations for doing veneers. So uh, let's take a look at the now types of uh, veneer preparations. When it comes to window preparation, window preparation means, if you look at the picture here, uh, the labial side of the tooth is prepared without touching the incisal edge. So that's a window preparation. That is the only labial side is prepared. We do not want to engage the incisal margin. So the contacts of the patient's tooth to tooth with the lower teeth is going to be the natural tooth itself. 
there is no preparation of the insulate aesthetic aesthetics wise this is not extremely aesthetic because the insulate is going to be the natural tooth so suppose the patient wants to enhance the radio uh, translucency of the insulate and all that you cannot use this technique in those cases you have to think of techniques which completely involves the insulate then we have a technique called feather technique feather edge technique feather edge means you do the labial surface and you keep it up to the incisal edge exactly till the incisal edge but you do not cross to the lingual surface or the palatal surface so that is called a feather edge preparation so some of the companies of veneers like 3m lava for example if you see their brochures you will read about 3m lava uh, they can accommodate feather edge margin preparations we'll come to all these things when we do our direct hands on just take a look at the pictures for now now when it comes to a bevel preparation you see we go up to the incisal edge and we slice the incisal edge so the incisal edge is sliced by about 1 mm or 1.2 mm or 1.5 mm depending on the case and when we slice the incisal margin that incisal portion is also made by the laboratory so if you want to have a very translucent incisal edge you can think of a bevel preparation and finally when it comes to an overlap preparation overlap preparation is when you cross the lingual uh, palatal side and you go stop somewhere at a margin on the palatal side so inside the labial side is prepared and you cross and you go towards the palatal side that's an incisal overlap preparation so any of these kind of preparations we can do for veneers so basically it covers the labial side of the tooth depending on the translucency depending on the patient's bite depending on the correction or uh, what is needed we may have to move from one technique to another clinical applications of these things i'll explain to you when we have our hands on keep this picture in mind that this is how the preparations are done when it comes to reduction uh, we always prepare more from the incisal edge because we know that the thickness of enamel is maximum at the incisal when you go towards the middle of the tooth the thickness of enamel reduces and we have enamel thinnest at the cervical edge so when it comes to preparations it's the same thing we follow up to 1 mm we can prepare in the incisal portion But when it comes to the middle portion of the tooth, we slice about 0.8 mm to 0.7 mm, even up to 0.5 mm. And when it comes towards the cervical side, we barely touch the tooth, or we only do the margin preparation. We do not want to cut too much of tooth structure. So this is almost how much we will cut when we are doing veneers. Now, if you look at these pictures from taken from the incisal edge of the tooth. what you can see is there are again two types of preparations one is when the natural contact of the tooth is intact if you look at the first picture the tooth has tooth to tooth contact there is no diastema there is no gap in that case when you do a veneer preparation we unnecessarily don't break the natural contact so when the natural contact of the tooth is good and the it's a flossable clean natural contact we unnecessarily don't cut it off we only prepare the labial portion so that the veneers don't come into contact what comes into contact is the tooth now when the second picture if you look there is a diastema or there is a gap between the incisors when such a case comes we have to slice the incisal portion and leave it for the laboratory to design that area for you so this is a preparation where the natural contact the natural gap between the tooth it does not exist so we have to slice the tooth and leave it straight with a margin so that the laboratory can carve and they can make the contact area for you so when a diastema comes the lab is in charge of closing the diastema for you you can always ask for a mock up first you can always ask how to do the preparation you can see first and then decide how you want to do the preparation now there is something called a zenith point zenith point is the highest point of contour of a tooth so if you look at these the plus sign on top of the tooth that is the zenith so sometimes when you want to close a diastema between two teeth if the zenith points are towards the distal part portion of the tooth only by increasing the and closing the gap the tooth will look very odd and bulky so you may have to do a gingivectomy you may have to move the zenith points towards the mesial side so that the tooth looks uniform when it is enlarged by a veneer so i don't know if you understood what i'm trying to say here but uh, clinical things like this we will take a look when we do our hands on but just see the pictures we may have to move these end points towards the mesial side so sometimes a perio procedure might be required to do before doing uh, veneer preparations we may have to do a periodontal uh, crown lengthening to expose more tooth area to change the end points 
Sometimes we have to do surgical procedures to remove the thick muscular frenum in between the teeth. That is probably the cause for the diastema. So if that cause is left there, even if you do the veneers, the diastema will keep on increasing if you haven't removed the thick muscular frenum. So a lot of times surgical procedures may have to be combined while doing veneer preparations. If you look at the contact points and the incisal embrasures, if you see the central incisors look like they have maximum tooth to tooth contact, slightly less for laterals, even lesser for canines. So this is the rule of contacts. So when you establish these contacts again, suppose it's a diastema, then the laboratory is in charge of doing it. But still, if you feel that the contacts have not been created properly, you can always ask the laboratory to create contacts in such a manner. And the incisal embrasure radius, if you look at it, it's least between incisors, slightly more between central and lateral, and much wider in between the canine and the centrals. If you remember the golden proportion, then the widest tooth that uh, looks when you look straight at a patient's mouth is the incisor. Laterals appear less wider than the centrals and canine appears much lesser than the lateral. So somewhat a ratio of about 1.6 is to 1 is to 0.6. These are not very uh, clinical things, but you have to just have an idea that these things have to be considered. Suppose you go against this and you make a very wide appearing canine. Uh, it might look that the tooth, the mouth is full of teeth. So we need those natural dark corridors on the sides of the tooth and all that. So for the, those reasons, these proportions and these kind of measurements are kept in mind. If you look at these pictures, when you are doing multiple teeth, like till the premolars, we try to do all feather preparations or uh, window preparations without touching the incisal edge. Why? Because we don't want to break the natural contact of the upper and lower teeth. So we do window preparations or we do uh, um, in uh, feather edge preparations. Now, what are the patient instructions that you give after doing veneers? So after doing veneers, you always give certain instructions so that uh, the veneers don't break. Of course, these are bonded restorations. They cannot break if you have followed the very normal uh, basics of preparation, but then still it is a very thin laminate. So you have to advise the patient. Use less abrasive toothpaste, avoid excessive biting forces, do not chew on hard pieces of ice or candy. Use a soft mouth guard when you are engaging in any form of contact sports like boxing, karate or something. And the surface stains, if they start coming in composite uh, veneers, they can always call the patient back and do a good polishing with aluminum oxide that will remove all the surface stains. Now, mouth rinses also. Very deeply colored mouth washes we usually don't give after we do composite direct veneers. The first 72 hours after you bond a veneer, we do not advise the patient to take excessively hot or cold food because that interferes with resin polymerization, which continues for about 72 hours. Alcohol, some kind of medicated mouth washes have also been shown to interfere with the bonding. So we do not use these things. Then routine cleaning is a must. So every four months you have to ask the patient to come back to you and you have to do a scaling where you don't engage a scaling tip on the margins of the veneer, but you only remove the calculus and the stains. Then the patient has to use a soft toothbrush, preferably an electric toothbrush is better for maintaining veneers. You can even use your water floss and all that and clean the interdental areas. Now, if you look at these two pictures, I've already shown you these pictures. One is where the tooth is in contact with tooth and the other one where there is a diastema. So when the tooth is in contact with tooth, we do not break the contact. But when there is no contact between the tooth, you slice it off and let the lab purple create the contact area for you. Now in this preparation, if you see, there is a composite restoration denoted by the green color. So when there is a preparation, when there's a restoration like that in between the teeth and you have to do two veneers, you have to go take your preparation below the composite restoration. So this is a case where you can intentionally break the natural contact because the natural contact here has been made with a restoration, which is not going to be a very strong base for your veneer. So sometimes when you do veneer preparations on teeth where composite restorations are there, you will see that when the preparation goes on, the moment you reach the composite restoration, the composite restoration starts vibrating and breaks off. So that's such a weak base, we cannot keep as a base for a veneer. So you have to build, take the margin below the contact point and break the composite restoration away. So this is a case where you intentionally break the natural contact. Then depending on where 
you want the aesthetic margin to be you can do either something called a short veneer a medium wrapping veneer or a long wrapping veneer a short wrapping veneer if you look at the second picture is denoted by the green color so this is a short wrapping veneer where the veneer, veneer margin is somewhat towards the labial side when you go slightly deeper it becomes a medium wrapping and a long wrapping is where you break the contact and you take the margin much below the tooth so this is depending on how much aesthetics you want suppose you do a short preparation short wrapping preparation and there is say a brown spot in between the teeth that brown spot is going to be there so you may have to remove it further make it a medium wrapping to see if the discoloration reduces suppose you do a long wrapping and still there is some kind of discoloration you can always ask the lab people and you can mark it and send it to them they can use some kind of an opaquing agent there and you can cover the discoloration for you otherwise you may have to change your preparation depending on discoloration present on the tooth and how much aesthetic you want in the tooth most of the time uh, ceramics of course we know shoulder margins are there but a deep chamfer or a normal chamfer of about 0.3 mm is preferred for doing veneers doesn't matter which kind of margin you give a chamfer a beveled uh, shoulder all these or uh, torpedo bar can be used all these margins are fine but for making it simple you can always keep a chamfer margin for a veneer so i'll just show you a case here where all the couple of things that i've told you so far has been combined together so this patient if you look at the upper teeth there is a mild diastema there is a small overlapping lateral incisor that is teeth number 1 uh, sorry 2 2 and if you look at the canine on uh, the, uh, if you look at tooth number 1 3 it is in cross bite with the lowers now cross bite in the lowers is not a good case for doing veneers because canine is a bite excessively biting tooth you unnecessarily don't want to give a very thin laminate on top of it so if the patient has no complaints with that unnecessarily do not touch it now we have gone for a correction of the diastema here and the slightly protruded uh, lateral incisor this is after orthodontic treatment so if you look at the preparations in the next page the preparations here what i have done is uh, if you look at the central incisors uh, there is a diastema in the center so i intentionally have sliced the tooth in the center and i have just made a chamfer margin it is a equigingival margin which is very much visible i could i would say it is slightly supragingival also because it can easily be cleaned and maintained and this doesn't cause much of a discoloration because the tooth as such is not severely discolored so all the preparations from lateral to lateral here are within 1 mm a very basic chamfer margin and the incisal the portion where there is no tooth to tooth contact the margins are just sliced off for the lab person to recreate that contact now when the veneer comes to you from the lab you have to mark it like this on a white paper tooth numbers 1 2 1 1 2 1 and you place the veneer one by one in the patient's mouth and you see if the fit is good once you feel the fit is good it is locking into the margins very well if you have not over complicated the preparations most of the time the fit is very fine and if you have done a good overlapping everything there need not be problems but the problem is sometimes 1 1 and 2 1 veneers might look exactly same so if you don't practice by keeping like this and seeing the fit in the patient's mouth you might accidentally loot 2 1 on 1 1 after you do the looting you do the bonding and curing and then you take 1 1 and keep it on 2 1 you realize the mistake and 1 1 may not go in and then you understand the problem and what happens is when you have etched and bonded a ceramic it is not easy to remove it like a natural crown so you may have to cut and remove the entire veneer that might disrupt the whole tooth preparation that might even cause further damages so always prepare but when is that comes from the lab you always see the fit see everything is going properly if the fit is not correct do not try to trim it with your bird do not try to trim it with your uh, hand piece and all that send it back to the lab tell them what the problem is take a new impression if it has to be taken take a good photograph all these have to be done and you have to send it back to the lab so once the veneer comes you loot it like this the margins you show the patient you ask the patient to brush it very well so that plaque accumulation doesn't happen and see if the diastemas are closed there should be a natural plausible contact there should not be any large contact see if the black triangle is very minimum see if it is cleansable see if the diastema is closed and the patient doesn't have any problems with the bite if the patient is convinced then you can go for the lowers in this case again there is diastema between the lowers the canines there is a gap there is a gap between the lateral and canine so that is going to be part 2 when the patient will come back and do it 
but of course this patient has never come back but uh, i know for a follow up of about 11 years now that this venies are functioning absolutely fine so these are cases simple cases where you can select for venies so good enamel coverage so if you look at the pre op pictures of these patient you see there is absolutely no composite restoration from the tooth there is healthy enamel young patient not much of caries not no dentin exposure good oral hygiene there is no calculus or anything uh, it's evident in the picture so these are cases where minor tooth spaces and things like that can be easily corrected by giving veneers so uh, basically very basic things about veneers these things are there are few things called uh, how to temporize veneers in between an appointment how to give temporaries and things like that so i'll just help you with a video i have uh, unfortunately it's in my phone so i need about 1 minute for transferring the video so once i get the video on screen i'll just show you how temporization can be done so if you can see these are uh, i hope it's clear for you these are ceramic veneers lithium disilicate veneers is large diastema there now temporization please take a look at uh, this is stem bond if you see what i have done is i have taken a pre op impression that is before preparing the tooth i have made a putty impression that i have kept it and after the preparation you can directly inject a material like this this is pro temp from preem so pro temp you can directly inject it into the veneer preparation spaces that you have made and then with the pre op impression you can directly press it against the patient's mouth once you prepare it against press it against the patient's mouth you have to hold it there for a period of 3 minutes because 3 minutes is the setting time of pro temp and after you hold it for 3 minutes you can slowly remove it and you will get the ready made veneers on the tooth that is your temporary veneers so once you get the ready made temporary veneers the excess you can trim it off with a burr and you can use light your uh, curing light and you can cure the veneers so final curing of pro temp you can do with light so about 3 minutes for chemical curing and about 40 seconds light in each tooth so temporization is very important for veneers why because you cannot leave prepared tooth surfaces open for a period of 3 to 5 days the patient could have sensitivity especially in the cervical area because that is the area where dentin exposure is more so you have to temporize by giving temporaries either you can use pro tem like materials or you can do is you can take an impression give it to the lab and by evening the lab guys can make acrylic temporaries for you so when you want to loot these temporaries you should use a cement that can be completely removed without altering your prepared tooth surface so you can use something called a spot bonding spot bonding means you take bonding agent one drop in the center of the temporary veneer you put a drop or even a minute speck and then you place it on the tooth and you cure it so next time the patient comes for final cementation you can just remove the temporary uh, with a probe and then you can just polish the tooth surface and then you can bond your veneers the so spot bonding is a way you can bond the veneers if you are using pro tem most of the time the temporary stays there without any cementation at all so basically our idea of temporizing is the next visit the patient should be able to remove this temporary without altering the tooth surface uh, you are clear with the type of preparations like for example these are all this is a new case that i just did today and got the veneers if you see that this is the lingual side of the teeth so the, if you see the lingual side the preparations you can see it depends on the tooth so for this tooth it's basically discoloration that's a problem this is an incisal lapping preparation that has come on the uh, to, uh, tooth uh, lingual side this is a tooth which is in diastema with each other so if you see this preparation it's a large preparation where the, the veneer is extending towards the diastema area this is almost like a crown the entire tooth is prepared that is because the tooth had caries the tooth had composite restoration the tooth had a diastema and lot of discolored enamel was there so it's almost like a crown preparation 
but this is just a modified venue preparation i'll teach you these kind of things when we meet and uh, if you look at the laterals again the only problem is the discoloration so wherever there is a natural contact i have not broken the contact when there is a gap i have uh, intentionally broken it so that the diastema can be closed with a better in a better way so when it comes to the same same preparation i'll show you the label side of the preparation how it looks so this is the label same to label side of the preparation so there is absolutely no spacing here if you look at it there is no spacing here and if you can see you can appreciate the translucency in the enamel areas so this kind of translucency of the incisal edge can you see it's a bit transparent this can be achieved only if you have done an incisal overlapping preparation if there is a window preparation and this tooth is there behind the tooth then it's not able we are not able to get this kind of a translucency so for translucency you have to go for a incisal overlap preparation then if you have corrections you have to send it back to the lab like for example this is a case where uh when we tried it on the patient the patient complained that the incisal edges were more squarish and she wanted it to be curved so you keep it in the patient's mouth you take a photograph you mark it like with this with an editing tool and you can send it back to the lab they will curve it for you so any kind of corrections you want to make you can always take a good photograph mark it and send it back to the lab rather than trying to correct it by yourself the most recommended bar for doing any kind of veneer preparations will be a chamfer like an o16 bar a red band chamfer bar if you look at the tip of it it's a small chamfer bar so these kind of chamfer red bars are more than enough for doing most of the veneer preparation you don't even need any other bars Thank mm -hmm. you.